The Cavalcade of America, sponsored by the DuPont Company, makers of better things for better living through chemistry, and starring Richard Widmark. Tonight's DuPont play is about a liberty ship in World War II and her strange, exciting mission. One of her officers was Maury Reynolds. And as our DuPont story opens, here's our star, Richard Widmark as Maury Reynolds. I was third mate on the Liberty ship Bedford Forest. She was carrying a cargo of aviation gasoline in a hold and a deck load of bulldozers. Seems like only yesterday. I was on watch on the starboard wing of the bridge just outside the wheelhouse. It was flying fish weather down there between the islands. So blue and tranquil, it was hard to remember there were Jap planes and Jap destroyers up over the horizon to the north. But when I looked down at the bulldozers lashed hub to hub across the hatches, and when I thought about the big oil drums and the anti-aircraft ammunition cases below decks, I remembered, all right. I lifted my glasses again and I made the slow circle, not looking for flying fish, but for the feathered fin of a periscope. And then a higher circle on the other blue above looking for a speck that might glint in the sun, looking for wings in the sun. Good morning, Reynolds. Morning, sir. I'll take over. Anything new? Not a thing, Mr. Jorgensen. Thought we might just have sighted the convoy again. Uh, just possibly. I guess not. No, they're at the beachhead, but now we're seven whole hours behind. We're out of it now. It's hard to take dragging behind like this, like a poor hound dog too old to hunt. Don't get excited, son. There's nothing you can do. Now, hey, let's have the glasses. Yeah, sir. You see, I got a brother up ahead on that beach, Mr. Jorgensen, in the 177th from Tennessee. Oh, I heard tell. Now, listen, son, there's nothing we can do. Since we broke down yesterday, the Bedford's been burning oil like a 12-year-old jalopy. Now, oh, we're out of this strike for good. General Forrest would have found something to do. Huh? Oh. Maybe so. But Captain Donald McIver ain't Nathan Bedford Forrest. He's old and he's sick and he's worn out, like his ship. How was he this morning? Worse. Fever's 103. Oh, my. You better get along below and have some rest yourself, son. Oh, but I can't. I... Well, yes, I guess so. And, uh, Reynolds. Yes? You, uh, you wouldn't resent a little personal advice? No, of course not, Mr. Jorgensen. Well, then, uh, don't talk so much about General Forrest. Sure, the ship's named for him, but yeah, the way you talk... Don't let it show so much. Joker Farrell and the others, they'll make you pretty miserable. They do, mister, they do. Ah, uh, don't give them so many chances. You know what I mean? Yeah, but they don't understand. Well, think it over. And as mate of this spavine tramp, I order you to get some sleep. Shove off, I relieve you. All right. I'll just stop in for a minute at the wireless shack. Take it easy, boy. Well, if it ain't Johnny Reb. Hi, all spoon bread. I'll cut it out. What's new out in the wide blue yonder? Not a thing. Well, they must have landed by now up ahead. You heard anything, Sparks? Nothing yet, Maury. Holy smoke. They'll be needing our stuff. Here we are just limping along. Old General Forrest must be galloping circles in his grave. How many horses was it he had shot out from under him now? Forty-nine? Twenty-nine. Now lay off, Farrell. <laughs> Gentlemen, fellow officers, comrades, our ferry boat has been shot out from under. All right, now. We all must ask ourselves, what would General Forrest do? That's enough. Quick as a flash, we all have the answer. Get there fustest with the mostest, and don't spare the horses. General <laughs> Forrest said first with the most. General Forrest was a gentleman. Meaning I'm not, kid? 
Well, maybe you're right. I've been out here in the boondocks too long. My thin veneer of civilization got all peeled off in New Guinea. Mm. But my heart's still young and gay, though I'm strictly not from Dixie. Now, I'm warning you, Farrell. Now, I'm gonna... Oh, now, don't mind me, kid. Look, we were peddling high octane in these parts for a long time before you came aboard. A long time. We've had breakdowns before. And worse, from the Japs. We've had it. Well, we get the stuff there when we can. This is a beat-up cargo ship, not a troop of cavalry. Yeah, but my brother Dave, my older brother, he's up there sure, with that outfit. Sure, sure, and I lost a brother at Anzio. And there's 20,000 brothers of somebody getting pasted on that lousy beachhead right now. If you think about it, you'll go nuts. So relax, relax. All right, all right. Sorry, kid, I talk too much. Okay, Joker, you win. a boy. And now, having delivered myself of those there noble sentiments, I shall hit the sack and curl up with a good book. I shall peruse my precious first edition of uh, Superman, the Man of Steel. So long, Sparks. So long. And Joker, on your way out, leave that door open so that I can get a little fresh air in here. After you, I need it. <laughs> Okay, Sparks. Come on, Stonewall. Stonewall. As General Forrest was wont to say, Chee! I guess they had a right to give me a cone over, but they didn't understand. My grandfather, Dabney Reynolds, rode with General Forrest from Shiloh to Chickamauga. When I come aboard this bucket, most of them thought Bedford Forrest was just a lot of trees up in Massachusetts or somewhere. So I told him, too often, I guess, about how old General Nathan Bedford Forrest captured Stewart's Yankee cavalry in the war between the states and Captain Bob Ingersoll's infantry and about the horses he lost in battle and all. Well, I was ready for the sack, too. Any sack. The door to the purser's cabin right next to the wireless shack was open... The bunk was empty, so I went in and I stretched out. I thought about Grandpa and the garden house back home in Nashville with the locusts and the tulip trees and the old man talking to Dave and me when we were kids of a summer evening. I guess I must have fallen asleep thinking about Grandpa. So that's how old Bedford captured Bob Ingersoll. Whole darn regiment he captured. Uh, you boys will pardon it, old man. I... And how many men did he capture, Grandpa? 1,700 plus. Plus how many? Dang it, nobody knows. In them days, David, we didn't care no ad machines. or no paperwork with Bedford. How many men did old Bedford have? There were 600 of us, Murray. Fine fellas, every one. Now, look here, boys. I told you that it was the last story. Time for my nap. Oh, gee. Just one more, Grandpa. <laughs> Just one more, please. Well, all right, all right. Boy, did I, did I ever tell you about the Battle of Gunsight Gap? Well, sure you did. Only last night. Shut week... up, Worm. No, Grandpa. I don't remember you ever did. Tell us now, please. Well, Ed, that one was old Bedford at his best. Look, I, I, I draw it out for you here in the dust with my walking stick, just uh, like a map. Uh, there, there was the Yankees uh, coming down this, this valley road. There. Uh-huh. And, and, and right here was, was we was with old Bedford on the other side of the mountain. Right, right here, see? Uh-huh. Well, sir, one of our scouts come in and he said, they're over there in the throat of the valley, and they don't know we anywhere around. Well, you know what that meant to General Nathan Bedford Forrest? Charge. Yes, sir. But it weren't so simple. No, sir Cause if we if we tried to go around that mountain either way, we'd have been too late. No, sir, we we didn't have time. There was only one thing to do. Go over the mountain. Well, no, no. There there, there was a gap, you see. They call it Gunsight Gap on on account it was so small. Nobody had never been through there. Not even hunters went that way. Uh, but old Bedford knew about it, and he knew we had to go through. So in we went. The gap was made by a creek, 
In half the time, we, we was in water up to a waist. Well, how'd you keep your powder dry? Dang it, Murray Reynolds, don't interrupt. We threw everything away except for ammunition. We threw all our gear away, bedroll and saddlebags and such. And, uh, well, even most of the horses got left behind. We only kept our swords and rifles. You didn't take the horses? Oh, uh, some of them. Some of them, boy. But lots of them broke their leg and got left behind in that uh, scramble through that awful gap in the mountain. It turned out, though, that we didn't need the horses. We got to that, that valley road right here before the Yankees. Well, to make a long story short, when we'd rounded them all up, Colonel Cobb, that was the Yankee commander, he said, General, I can't figure out where my tactics was mistaken. And old Bedford said, 15 minutes above is worth a week of tactics. That's what he said. But that ain't the end of the story, Grandpa. No, indeed it ain't. For as soon as we got to marching them down the road, from out of the bushes ahead, we heard rifle fire. And the first thing we knew, we were surrounded. Uh, hey. Oh, it's a wireless. Something's up. Hey, Sparks. Sparks, what are they saying? Shh. Quiet. This is for us, all right. Well, what did they say? Looks like orders. I'll have to take it to the captain. But the captain's sick. Well, then the mate ought to see it, I guess. Well, I'll get Jorgensen. While I'm getting him, you can be breaking it. I'll be right back. This dispatch is important, all right. We got orders. Now, the main attack on Tulanga, where we were headed, has been fairly successful. But a secondary operation against the next island, Sula's in bad trouble. Uh-oh. Our troops landed okay, took the airstrip, and brought in planes. The Nips made a lucky hit and blew up our gasoline and ammunition. Oh, that's bad. Corsairs are grounded, the outfit's short of ammo. Hmm. More Jap planes have been reported coming down from the north. The Japs will be on top of them in an hour over there. In short, the deep six. What are the orders? We're to get to Sula as fast as we can. Now break out that chart, Reynolds. Yes, here it is. I'll spread it out. Now, let's have a look. There's Sula. Now, here's our noon position, south by west of Sula. By now, we must be just opposite the island, directly west of it. Ah, but there's this barrier reef in between us and them. Well, we'll have to steam north about, about 20 miles around the end of the barrier island chain. And come down this channel down here. Yeah, and if we do that, just about here, the second wave of Jap planes will catch up with us, and X marks the spot. It's suicide. We haven't got time to go up around those islands. Yeah, you're right. We haven't got the time. We haven't got time. We didn't have time to go around the mountain. There was this gap, you see. They called it Gunsight Gap, but count it was so small. But old Bedford knew about it, and he knew we had to go. Reynolds, hey, snap mm -hmm. out of it. We're in the war again. Oh, yeah. And boy, are we expendable. I, uh, I, I was just thinking. Sick as he is, Captain MacIver will have to decide here. I'll see him at once. Farrell, take over the watch. Hi, can I go along? Huh? Yeah, come along. What's the matter, boy? Nothing, nothing. Uh, can I look at that chart for a moment? I think maybe... Maybe I've got an idea. You are listening to The Cavalcade of America starring Richard Widmark as Maury Reynolds. Sponsored by the DuPont Company, makers of better things for better living through chemistry. Another one of the DuPont Company's better things for better living through chemistry is Dulux Super White Enamel. With this product, you can have gleaming white woodwork that will stay white and sparkling for years. And since Dulux Super White gives such a hard, smooth surface, it resists dirt and smudging and is so easy to keep clean. Your painting contractor will be glad to give your interior woodwork new life, new charm, with Dulux Super White Enamel. And you can rely on his professional skill for a good paint job. Dulux Super White Enamel is one of DuPont's better things for better living through chemistry. Our 
our DuPont cavalcade continues. We return to the Liberty ship, the Bedford Forest, with her hold full of aviation gas and a load of bulldozers on deck, laboring slowly ahead through tropic seas to beleaguered Sula, helpless under threat of air attack. Captain McIver, his eyes burning with malaria, has roused himself at the news of possible action. Half carried by Jorgensen and Maury Reynolds, he reaches the bridge and is... There's only one possible decision, Mr. Jorgensen. We'll have to push up north around the barrier. At this rate, sir, it'll take us too long to round the point. We'll be too late. The Jap planes are sure to catch us in the channel. We've got to try. Captain McIver, sir. What is it, Mr. Reynolds? Well, maybe there's another way. Look here at the chart. Uh, it shows a straight, see? Uh, a gap in the reef here, right opposite us, right opposite Sula, where we are now. It's barely five minutes away. Oh, I can't see, boy. I can't see. My eyes blur. How wide is that gap? Oh, it looks to be about uh, 60 feet or so. It's wide enough. Is it numbered on the chart? Yes, it is. 116. Oh, wait a minute. I remember now, and we were briefed. Oh, that passage is not navigable, son. Nobody goes through there. But, Captain, the tides are high. If we reach it on a good tide, Get we can... Get the tide tables, Mr. Reynolds. I see. Jorgensen Farrell. Yes, sir. Come here. Yes, sir. Boys, an idea. We can get through the barrier. Take a look at the chart. There's a straight, number 116. It's never used. They warned us in port. We'd hang her up on the coral. Mm. And when the Japs came in, boom, a sitting duck. Hey, yes, sir. Tide table. Read it, son. Uh, tide will be full and high, a perigee at 315. That's 15 minutes from now. And plenty of water at mean high tide, too, the chart says. Mm. We're drawing about 27 feet now, I'd say. We can make it with luck. By all that's holy, we'll try. Mr. Jorgensen. Aye, sir. Come left. Mr. Farrell, call the chief. Tell him to give me all he's got, even if he has to gag the safeties. We've got to make that tide. Uh-oh. Call me Shipwreck Farrell. Old Bedford knew we had to go through, so in we went. <laughs> There's the gap, dead ahead. Oh, thank God my eyes are clearing. Come left a little, Mr. Jorgensen. Steady, sir. steady. According to the chart, there's a soft bottom at the eastern mouth here, but there's coral rock ahead near the Sula Bay entrance. Captain MacGyver, sir, we're yeah. turning bottom. Look at the wake. knocking coconuts off the trees on both sides, and we're navigating on mud. Well, we'll know in a minute now. The rock bottom's right ahead. Mr. Reynolds? Yes, sir? Tell the chief to start pumping out all the tanks, even the fresh water. There's the opening. You can see Sula across the bay. Maybe we're over, mister. Maybe we're through. <laughs> that does it. We're hung up. Higher than a kite and twice as pretty. Ah, there's not enough water. We're loaded so heavy. Out in the open, too, where the Japs can see how pretty we look when they come to call. Gents, prepare to receive a certain convocation of politic worms. Shakespeare. Not to mention bulldozer parts in the belly. We're loaded too heavy. We threw all our gear away, bedroll and saddlebags and such. Even most of the horses got left behind. We only kept our swords and rifles. Captain McIver. I'm sorry, boy. It was a good try. Captain, the bulldozers. If there's anything those guys ashore don't need now, it's bulldozers. Now, if we could get rid of the boy, deck load... Boy, you're right. All hands, all hands. All right, sir. Get us in the deck cargo. Chop the lashings and prime more. All hands. Push those bulldozers into the side. Your job, Mr. Farrell. You get down there too, Mr. Reynolds. I see. There wasn't time to rig the cargo booms and no steam to spare for the deck winches. We unshipped the chain rails and knocked away the bracing with sledgehammers. And then we edged those bulldozers over the side, pried them over the scuppers with pinch bars, wrestled them into the sea. The bosun and the sailors, the steward and the messman, the off-watch fireman and the engineers, they were all there. And Farrell was everywhere, yelling like mad, working like a fiend. And so was I. One by one, they went over until we could feel a light. Until there were only two big brutes left. The biggest bulldozers in the world, I guess. They were hard up by the hatch comb and we couldn't move them. The men pushed and strained, but... Leave off. 
There's your work. Cut it out. No use. Hey, wait a minute, Phil. I got an idea. These babies are all gassed up and ready to eat dirt. I saw to it myself. Orders. They expected to build a strip on Tulanga in a hurry. What about it? Did you ever drive one, Joker? No, but I can drive a tractor. Well, how about it? Sure, let's go. You take Agnes here, and I'll take Beulah. To one side, men, the sea feeds of land. Don't forget, when you get it started, open her all the way. And when you get to the rail, jump for the deck, okay? Okay. Yippee! General Forrest rides again. Gee, What do you know? It worked. Yeah. You all right, kid? Yeah, yeah. I guess I'm okay. And look, we're off the rocks. Mr. Douglas in full speed ahead. Mr. Reynolds, is there a dock on Sula? Yes, sir. Unless we knocked it out in the attack, the Japs built one. Well, if there's no dock, we'll pile the Bedford up on the beach and unload the drums in the surf. You see anything, Mr. Farrell? Yes, sir. There's a dock, all right. It's swarming with Joes. But they can smell that gas coming. Four o'clock. If the Japs are on time, our boys will have to get that stuff off fast. They'll have about 15 minutes. 15 minutes, Bob. What's that, son? Oh, uh, nothing. Nothing, nothing. Uh, Spox has been trying to reach him. Maybe they'll be ready to unload. Yeah, there's cranes on that dock. Man, after nudging those bulldozers around, I'll be glad to see those doughfoots go to work. I aim to watch from the balcony, fanning myself gently. Lift that barge, coat that bale. <laughs> oh, boy, look at them wrestle those drums up the beach. Yes, sir. But they've got 20 off in the first two minutes. That's a lifeblood. Maybe we should give him a hand, huh, Farrell? Who, me? Sure. I'm an officer, sir, and a gentleman. Uh-huh. Ahoy there, ashore. What outfit are you? The 177th Tennessee, first and foremost. Yahoo! Great heavens. They're Confederates. Hey, that's my brother's regiment. Not so fast, Watson. Maybe they're northern spies. I'll find out. Uh. Ahoy, below. What you want now, sailor? Here's the $64 question. How many horses did General Nathan Bedford Forrest get shot out from under him? Twenty-nine! Right! Kid, we came to the correct address, we and did. we got here fastest with the mostest. Now, I told you, he did not say that. You win, kid, you win. <laughs> you know, I'll bet somewhere back home in Tennessee there's a statue of old Bedford. Sure there is. I must be psychic. Where is it? In Forest Park, Memphis. He's riding King Philip. King Philip? Mm-hmm. That uh, would be the horse that didn't get conked? Mm-hmm. Kid, you know what I'm going to do when I get home? What? I'm going to board that midnight choo-choo straight for Memphis, Tennessee. I'm going to have me three quick mint juleps. Mm. And then, sir, then I'm going to go out to that park... And kiss King Philip right on the snoot. <laughs> hey, look, the planes are taking off. One, two, three, four, five. First with the most. First with the most. What's that, kid? Fastest with the mostest, Joker. Fastest with the mostest. Our thanks to Richard Widmark and the Cavalcade players for tonight's story. Now, Bill Hamilton speaking for the DuPont Company. If you were walking down the main street of Crystal City, Texas tonight, 
you would see a life-size statue of Popeye the Sailor Man. Now, you might stop right in your tracks and wonder, with a smile, what on earth he was doing there. Well, let me tell you. He's there because 35,000 acres around Crystal City and Eagle Pass are planted with spinach, Popeye's own preferred muscle food. Not so long ago, the spinach growers of Texas were losing as much as half their crop year after year. A fungus disease known as white rust was doing the damage. Each season, growers suffered losses. And when food growers suffer, we all, as consumers of food, suffer through our pocketbooks. So one day, if you strolled out on the highway from Crystal City, you would have seen an airplane behaving in a strange way. Crisscrossing a field of spinach, the plane would swoop, its wheels almost touching the plants, spreading a white fog behind it. A DuPont technical representative had arranged with an airplane company to dust the plants with DuPont parsate fungicide, attempting to cover the bottoms as well as the tops of the leaves. In cooperation with the Texas Agricultural Experiment Station and the growers, he was trying to find out if white rust could be controlled by dusting spinach fields with chemicals from the air. If so, the Texas growers would get better crops. What was learned in Texas could be passed along to growers in all parts of the country. Everybody would benefit, including you and me as consumers. And of course, the DuPont Company would have another way of serving you with agricultural chemicals. In this actual case, the DuPont technical man did help solve the problem of the Texas growers. White rust was brought under control. And today, and tomorrow, and the day after tomorrow, other DuPont men will help to solve problems for agriculture, for the steel industry, the rubber industry, the textile industry. DuPont customers get more than the products they buy. They get the benefits of a century and a half of technical know-how, along with the DuPont Company's Better Things for Better Living through Chemistry. Next week, the DuPont Cavalcade will present another of your favorite Hollywood stars, Robert Cummings. Our story, Decision in the Valley, is the suspenseful drama of a doctor who gambled his life to save someone he loved, then was asked to take the same chance for the sake of a stranger. Be sure to listen to next week's DuPont Cavalcade and our star, Robert Cummings. Tonight's DuPont Cavalcade was written by George H. Faulkner and was adapted from a short story by Walter Havighurst. Richard Widmark appeared by arrangement with 20th Century Fox, producers of Under My Skin, starring John Garfield. Music was composed by Arden Cornwell and conducted by Donald Voorhees. The program was directed by John Zoller. DuPont congratulates Paul Vogel for winning one of the Motion Picture Academy of Arts and Sciences Awards. His much sought-after award was for black-and-white photography used to film the Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer production Battleground, photographed on DuPont motion picture film. Ladies and gentlemen, every one of us wants the children of our nation to grow into strong and useful citizens. By buying Easter seals, you ensure those children who have been crippled by disease or accident the help and special services they need. Buy Easter seals this year. Buy a lot. Thank you. The DuPont Cavalcade of America comes to you from the stage of the Belasco Theater in New York and is sponsored by the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware, makers of better things for better living through chemistry. Next, hear Baby Snooks and Daddy on NBC.